la just in 2020. and welcome to Teatro Atea, La Tea Remoto. It's a very exciting night because we're in the second night of MLK, an Afro-Latin thing for Martin Luther King. And this is nothing but a, a, a homage, a very heartfelt homage that was started, you know, uh, four editions ago. This is the fourth edition. And, uh, and it uh, means to get like Afro-Latin artists, uh, Afro-American artists, and anyone who really cares about the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement to participate and form community. And with that in mind, uh, we, started, uh, uh, we started this. This is a two-person project. And we started with Taylor Roger, a close friend, um, an associate and visionary. And, uh, and tonight we have uh, Deborah Taylor, is his widow and the mother of their son. Hi, Deborah. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm so happy and so honored and so and feeling the spirit of Roger with us because oh my God, us. he's everywhere. He's everywhere. He's around me. He's so happy about this. I know. You know? Well, we, we we had two years together, like getting it off the ground and struggling yes. with this. And here we're still struggling, but mm -hmm. but it's a point of pride that 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 we're doing this at this very crucial juncture not just because of the pandemia, but because of the historical events taking place and because yes. this is the right thing to do. So, um, right thing to do. yeah, and, and before, before, you know, before going further, um, 
I want to make sure that people know uh, a little bit uh, about yourself. I mean, you're, you're an educator. You, you've been teaching mm -hmm. in the New York uh, public schools. Um, mm -hmm. You are a mother and you've raised mm -hmm. uh, a young man. I, I understand that Romare is out of uh, college. They graduated. Yes. yes. And, yes. Um, and with Taylor, you've, you've participated in this MLA cast, you know, for, for some time now. So um, this is, this is uh, Debbie Taylor. Thank you, Debbie. Um, anyway, yes. uh, we, 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 we're going to read a quote. Uh, first of all, tell us a little bit about, about Taylor, about Roger. Well, you know, it's interesting. I am. Um... I was thinking about this when, when we talked earlier, and I was never exactly clear when you and Roger met, but I do know that he found a kindred spirit in you. And the two of you, I know that you would, um, you, he would come up to the, the uh, theater and you guys would have like these deep conversations. And then you were like really inspirational for my son, who's also an artist. And, and the three, three guys, you got together, you hung out in the space. And um, I think it was great. Um, this is a very creative space for creative people because Roger was very creative. Roger, you know, he wrote and he wrote poetry. He, he was a, a student of, of the, the, the history of people of color, uh, particularly uh, African-American culture. And, uh, you know, it's, I'm, I'm still finding his poems everywhere and I'm reading them. And they, they, I can tell where, where his mind was at the time when he was writing the poetry. So I'm glad that he, he left that behind for me. Um, but, you know, professionally, Roger was a, a librarian um, and he worked um, at, at several branches, but the two longest stints were at neighborhood branches um, at Hamilton Fish, right on Houston Street in Tonkin. Lower East Park. Side, Lower East, yes, side, Lower East yes. side, which is where he grew up. Grew up I'm living in the apartment where he grew up in. Um, and matter of fact, this was our office, which in early times was his grandmother's room. So, um, so most of the, and I think most of the books in here are, are Roger's books. So, uh, yeah, so we, um, yeah, so he, he, he was a librarian um, and he just was, you know, always about books and reading. When I met him, he was reading a book in a club. Who does that? But that's, that's how we met. <laughs> so, <laughs> what, it, what, it, what it do is on the rocks. So it, it was cool to me. That was very cool to me. But uh, yes, yeah, so he, 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 the idea of the, of the MLK, or how do you pronounce it? You say MLK, 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 however you say yes. it, Debbie. Yes, but um, I'm not sure. I think it came out of some writing from his work in progress site, but I'm not sure. And that's another thing that's uh, next on my agenda is to bring the site back to life again. But um, he, he, he wanted to bring sort of like artists and, and creative people together in celebration of the, the spirit of, of Dr. King. So this was his, um, this was like a, this idea that was festering with him for a long time. And the two of you just took it and ran with it. And it was exciting. It's exciting um, bringing like musicians and dancers and and people who just talk, you know, intellectual discussions and things like that, which is great. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's it. And, uh, you know, he, he, he's, he's not here where I can see him, but he's here all the time. Well, I thank you for that, you know, sort of chronology, biography, sort of, uh, of, of Roger Taylor. Uh, my colleague and friend, um, your, your husband and, and Romare's father. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a privilege and an honor, not just knowing him and sharing my studio, my visual art with him, but also our conversations and, and the fruit of our friendship, which is this MLK effort yeah. that it's ongoing. But without further ado, we are here to honor uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, his legacy, his, his remarkable wisdom in his words, and his profound love for humanity, um, yes. and his vision for an uh, equitable society. So would you care to, to regale us with, with a quote from Dr. King? Yes. So um, the quote I chose um, is from a commencement speech that Dr. King gave at Oberlin College, which is interesting. Um, Oberlin is where Roger graduated from. Um, wow. This speech was given in 1965. Um, Roger graduated, I think, like around 73. But um, so this was uh, 
Dr. King speaking to the graduating class of Oberlin College in Ohio, which a lot of people don't know was a stop on the Underground Railroad. So it, had a it has a long history. So this is the quote. So I'm looking at another screen. So that's why I'm looking this way. <laughs> you know. So, um, and he said to the seniors, the contemporary tendency in our society is to base our distribution on scarcity, which has vanished, and to compress our abundance into the overfed mouths of the middle and upper classes until they gag with superfluity. If democracy, if democracy is to have a breadth of meaning, it is necessary to adjust this inequity. It is not only moral, but it is also intelligent. We are wasting and degrading human life by clinging to archaic thinking. And, and to me, that whole thing about, about inequity and, and democracy just speaks to everything that's happening, that's happened well, for the la last four years, but especially evidence this whole week. Yesterday or the day before no, yesterday. Day before yesterday, I'm still like in shock. I'm still in shock for that. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. Thank you for that quote, Debbie, and uh, and for and and for just joining us today. I, I remember you joining us last year, which was a, a a moment of where you were still. I'm sure you're still sad, but that was a you were still profoundly sad. And I remember you coming and to the bar and bringing a little bit of of Roger's spirit and. Uh, and sort of blessing the Emelika of, of last year. So the fact that you're here with us and presenting so an event, I think it's it's a sign that you know that things that life keeps going on. That we will always acknowledge those that have fallen, but that we will take their spirit on for the future, like we're trying to do with Dr. King, Roger, and I. Yes. So. Yes. Um, anyway, what's going on tonight? I think you were going to present something. What are you presenting? Yes. I am going to present, and this, this is so much, I graduate would have loved this, an art talk with you, Miguel Treyes, and social reckoning cult curators, I'm sorry, let me do social reckoning curators, Anderson Pilgrim and Alexis Mendoza. And I have to ask you, explain to me, I have an idea, I know what a curator does, and I know what social reckoning is, and I'm putting the, like, can you, what, like, what is the two together like? Well, I guess I'll find out when I watch. I'll yeah, that's watch a great question see. for what's following, but just yes. to give people a heads up, um, the, the title was, uh, was uh, Alexis Mendoza came up with the title. The curators are the people that chose, uh, that choose the artist and the artwork and that sort of give the spin. And I think mm -hmm. social reckoning, and again, we'll, the, 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 the curators will speak to that. I think has to do with this particular moment in the history of the United States in the world and how there is a, there is a need to acknowledge what has been done wrong and what it can be done right in our society in terms okay. of, of, of race relations. So yes. I think that's, but let's see, they're going to tell us right okay. now. So we're going to go to social reckoning with Alexis Mendoza and uh and anderson pilgrim good evening buenas noches thank you all and thank stay you. with la tea we have more programs thank you debbie Good evening, buenas noches, and welcome to Teatro Lateas, Teatro Lateas Remoto, and our uh, week-long celebration of MLK, an Afro-Latin thing for Martin Luther King. Here tonight with me, I have the two co-curators of the incredible social reckoning exhibition that is uh, one of the core, uh, one of the cores of MLK this year. Uh, hello, Anderson Pilgrim. Hello, Alexis Mendoza. Como están? Yeah, hi, good evening. Pleasure. Good evening, everyone. It's, uh, it's great too that we could, you know, first of all, have this exhibition. We really have a debt of gratitude with the Clemente Soto Vélez Cultural Center because they sort of realized, um, you know, the importance of, of giving MLK uh, some, some more space 
And lo and behold, we have the Abrazo Gallery in the second floor now serving as another platform to the MLK exhibition. So Fantastic. thanks again to the folks at the Clemente. Um, uh, as you as you all know, the exhibition is at the Abrazo Interno and also a little bit at La Tea. Because of social distancing, because of the COVID epidemic, we're all being very careful about it. I don't have a date for an opening, if indeed we can have an opening. I, I And I don't know how it's going to go. But we will keep uh, showing the exhibition virtually. And for example, tonight, uh, let me just introduce Anderson Pilgrim. Anderson is um, is a friend of Platea and of the Clemente. He actually suggested uh, one of the artists that just uh, that was included in um, uh, Body IEP. So we're really indebted to him. But really, he is the you know the founder and and director of the Contemporary Caribbean Fine Art Fair in Barbados. So that's that's uh, for us from the Caribbean. That's a point of pride and something that we hope continues. You were able to do it last March, right, uh, Anderson? Yes, we, we were actually the last event that was held on the island before they shut down for COVID. Will you go virtual AI. this year? Well, it's March, yeah, right? Will you go 2021, virtual? Uh, March 20, uh, 10th to the 24th, we will be virtual. The information will be available on uh, our platforms, you know, Facebook, Instagram, and and uh, and the uh, event website, uh, kafafir.com. So that's not uh, that long ago, that long away from us. So please uh, yeah, uh, join us. Months. I want to yeah. see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll share that information, and I'm sure we can get that out to all of our listeners. Well, anyway, it's a big uh, bio that we have for, for for Anderson. So we're gonna like just go on to Alexis, so we can start talking about the art. And Alexis Mendoza is uh, 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 an artist, uh, also writes. Well, actually, like Anderson, um, and uh, is also a curator. Now, uh, Alexis um, is basically um, a, a painter, an incredible abstract painter. Uh, we've shared uh, over the years. And uh, I remember a couple of shows recently in 20, 2017, I went to Ken Keleba Gallery in the Lower East Side and, and enjoyed oh, yeah. a, an incredible show of Alexis pieces. Uh, other than that, I, I participated in a group show uh, that, he, that, that, that he invited me to at the Bronx Arts Factory. That was also quite impressive, some tondos. Uh, but beyond that, um, one of the most impressive aspects of Alexis's work is, is the Bronx uh, Triennial, uh, something that he's worked in for, how, how long have you been at the, at the Triennial, Alexis, did, did you well, start? Uh, the Triennial is an evolution of the Bronx Latin American Art Biennial. Right. So the New York Triennial, or the Latin American Art Triennial, is really an evolution of, of what we did since 2008 with the, with the Latin American Art Biennial. And then on 2019, we, we become a Triennial because the last biennial we did was in 2016, and then we prepare for three years to 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 do sh to do ten shows in three months for all over New York City, and uh, that includes you know artist talk, conference, you know, public events, and then you know, public interventions and and, and things like that. And that's um, at the end of the year, so there's a chance that it can happen this year, right? Or, or no, we got no, it's happening years. 2022, 2022, so we good, we good for now. Yeah, By then, we're all vaccinated, so I hope. Well, right. and besides, besides the triennial, Alexis has been a, a very welcome presence at the Clemente for a long time. He was co-curator uh, with me of the Boricuba, which is when we started hyphenating uh, the Borimix exhibit, so I'm, I'm indebted to him for that. And not just that, this MLK project started with Alexis curating the first show and we had people like Juan Sanchez participate. We even got a review thanks to our critic, uh, well, poet, uh, journalist and critic, Jonathan Goodman. So he's an old hand. So without further ado, here we are, social reckoning. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow. I still have a dream. And I want to ask you, gentlemen, 
Um, we, we, we say, or you say rather, in the, in the exhibition uh, manifesto or the curatorial statement rather, that you know, this is, seeks to aim uh, attention, to bring attention to basic human rights. So that's very broad. Let's start with that. I, I just think that it's, it is a broad um, topic, but it's so prescient to live in it. Uh, with the the evolution of the uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, the events of these last few days and the last few years, really, where uh, you know people of color have been marginalized and ill treated, and so on and so forth, and the attention that it has been that has been brought to the subject, I think that. As, uh, as artists, you know, that have uh, approached this subject, we want to bring that to people's attention. So, I, you know, it's uh, the timing, I think, is perfect. I That's totally it. agree. I think, uh, I think these days and uh, uh, in the, in the, the moments that we are living demand uh, projects like this and, and platform like this when artists can express what really, really is going on and how present are how present is the uh, the the how present are the thinking of of Martin Luther King and, and all his ideals with because it's about his spirit really exactly and his, his ideas his, his spirit his ideas and his ideals yeah that, and uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and there is very much present not only in the show but also the artists ha uh, yes. carry that philosophy and it is expressed in all the artworks present in the uh, in the uh, in the show. And a, a very, a very, very rewarding experience, you know, and learning experience, you know, interconnecting and talking to you and and, Miguel and you know, exchanging, you know, views and 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 and, and expressing all these things, and it's been a very rewarding experience and, and a learning experience as well. Um, since we're talking about Martin Luther King, I just wanted to to bring up the fact you're you're both very accomplished curators in our in our you know, in our communities, you know, and, and we're talking all the way to Barbados, uh, Cuba, and, and, and San Juan, and, and here, you know, and in New York, you know, many projects where we invite our artists, you know, artists from our communities to exhibit, we're always striving to get that scene, you know, to keep that scene vital. And so, you know, when, when we come to a show like this, uh, MLK in th this year's edition, Social Reckoning, which we've also sort of helped uh, used to baptize the whole the whole MLK right? right um what do we how do we operate how what do you guys feel like should we go literal the image of, of Pedro Albizu Campos the image of Marti the image of Martin Luther King and sort of work with that or or do you think it's more important to sort of give the freedom and see what evolves and how because I've seen both and to be quite frank, there's something very empowering of those uh, community exhibitions where the images kept get kept getting reiterated, you know, by different artists. And you see, sure. but yet, you know, artists somewhat they chafe sometimes at those restrictions, and then you get a loosey goosey sometimes kind of thing where it's either on or off. What do you guys think as curators? Uh, I, I I prefer to give artists the freedom. Right? I mean, that's always been my approach. I like to be able to put the theme out there, give it the kind of uh, rapid that I want to put on it, but then allow the artist to take that and run with it, you know, and uh, express, you know, their feelings, their take on it, usually, and try, try not to restrict them and, and put them in a box, you know, just let them. Uh, so this is, this is how I prefer to approach things like this. But of course, imagery is important. And, uh, you know the the Martin Luther King image and the way how you work we work it. I mean, you see, Dia Hennis uh, uh, has done a, a remarkable job in interpreting his image, and you know he's done a series of prints on on him and and so on. And uh, you know those are iconic images. So you know it's just a matter of uh, I guess taste. And I'm working with Alexis, so it's uh, you know we are able to combine or knowledge <laughs> or knowledge and or motivations behind these things you know i what think about? uh, uh, the, uh, uh the, uh i approach this uh this project specific with the idea of including artists that are going to bring different subjects and they're not going to concentrate in the image itself you know of course you know 
some of them I know they're gonna focus on the on the image of the of the Martin Luther King, but I select artists that I know are gonna focus more in the broad, you know, idea of or, or broad ideas of a specific subject. For example, uh, Frank de las Mercedes, he worked with the image of of George Floyd. Uh, 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 Julia Justo and, 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 and Wildriana, they working with the, no, Julia Justo working with the, with the, with the, the democracy itself or in the United States and the inequality that is right. happening, you know, in this country. And uh, uh, Wildriana and Gianni, they are working specifically with the women's right. You know, how, how far women's right been because, you know, at the beginning when women's got the right to vote, Black women couldn't vote. So they are working with all these subjects, but in a more conceptual way of expressing. So it's not literal, it's not a specific. You have to talk to the artist, you have to integrate, you have to ask questions in order to get most of the answers that the that our work is trying to express. So uh, for example, Nelson Alvarez is, is working with the with the with the image of Selma, the, the bridge. You know, so he's like yes, uh, using yeah. using different. They are using different ways to express because it's not just because about that itself is iconic, itself. Iconic, it's iconic about all his history, yeah. his resume, all he what he did. So they're trying to capture all that and bring it into one single show, and and it's unbelievable. For on the other hand, in Abrazo, we have a, a group of artists that are working more into the the African African American. Uh, uh, base itself, you know, like Tanda Francis, she's, she's a remarkable sculptor and then she's uh, presenting artworks that are specifically working on the race, the black thing, blackness. Thing. Well, may, maybe Anderson, maybe Anderson can wait in because uh, when we were, you know, chatting right before this, uh, this program, you know, I, I find it very interesting that, that uh, you know, when Anderson came in and, and, and joined and, and sort of the, the exhibition sort of broadened and it has a more, let's say, Pan-African approach because we have the Afro-Latin, we have the African-American, and then this diasporic sense in some of the pieces themselves. Uh, Anderson, is that is that something you did on purpose? And, and how are these, uh, you know, strands sort of uh, managed by you guys? Well, yeah, that's, I think that's one, of the, <laughs> that's one of the roles I play into bringing in a few disparate voices uh, and uh, that diasporic effect, as you said, you know, um, we, have, we have artists, uh, Carla Amor from D Dominica. And again, she is a, she's born in the Caribbean, but she was trained in, in New York and she lives in the UK. So her experience uh is quite different than someone who maybe grew up all their life in in uh, the united states or one of, uh, one of these other uh, countries as a person of color and uh, you get that aspect of it uh Taffa, the ghanaian artist who uh one of his series of march images is part of the show and he uh examines the whole concept of uh america which is protest the, the, the protest movement and how you know different people approach it we've seen protests that lives matter we've seen protests of quote unquote white supremacists uh, 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 trying to topple the uh, united states capitol so it's, it's how you protest you know people look at it in different ways so we have someone like Tapa who, who approaches that and uh, Adamola Olubofola, who looks again at the issue of race, very plain and simple, the, the issue of race in America, which is perpetuated in all of these different uh, movements. So yeah, we wanted to bring different voices and throw a little mix in there. And uh, I think we, we accomplished that. And, 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 and again, it goes to have people investigate these, these different subjects and, and look at them through the artist eyes and ask themselves questions also. And, and, and Alexis, in, in your experience, I mean, we're talking diasporic, you know, the, the, the diaspora, which is huge, 
And then we have this, this two very important parts, the African-American and then the Afro-Latino, you know, the Asperas. Uh, do, do you think some of the, the potential differences in experiences in, in those two diasporas, so when we're talking about two diasporas, you know, the, Nor the North American or the African American, and then the, the Latin American or Afro-Latino perhaps, and then Afro-Caribbean, which are part of the whole diaspora. Do you think the difference in experience, if there are such, are they manifest in some of the works that we have or, or how do you see well, that? Yes, uh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, the, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Afro-Latino experience, they are very much present in the, in the show. You know, Alex Fernandez, you know, is, 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 is expressing that, that very much in, in his piece and the piece that he's presenting, Jose Luis Tejeda also are working in, 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 this, in, in this matter. But uh, like I was mentioning before, there is a, there is a way to to express different ways of, or, or, or express different way of the diasporic uh, Afro-Latino. You know, Diego Anaya is, is presenting a, a conceptual piece that is very, is, is beautiful. And, and, and Darwin Erazo also, that is presenting a, a piece from the Afro, uh, 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 Afro-Equatorian point of view, which is in, super interesting because, you know, we don't, we here, we don't know. I mean, I'm from Cuba. And Anderson is from Barbados and is from the Caribbean. And, uh, and then uh, I don't know much about some of these diasporic ways of expressing. And this is, this, is awareness, this is a learning experience for me because interacting with the artists, talking with them, getting to know the, the artwork that are, they are presenting for something that we are working on, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. It's very interesting. And it's, it's, it's beautiful in the sense that we get, to, we get to know the artists a little deeper because they are presenting artworks that are they have they have a very uh, philosophical meaning behind the piece the behind what we see behind the image is yeah. something yeah. else it's something deeper than that and andrade he's presenting the 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 work from inspired by by a song by nina simone you know a strange fruit you know like yeah. about the oh, yes. lynching and the hanging so you know he's he's bringing something to the table that is very much you know, reminiscent to what she was saying in the 60s, and then he bring it to the to the to a discussion to the table, and it's a very very powerful piece. Yeah, yeah, make, make it contemporary. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, and would you say, Anderson, would would there be a piece just like Alexis is bringing up various pieces? Would you feel there? I mean, we've talked a little bit about the Caribbean angle. We've talked about the Latin angle. Would you feel there's also a piece that would be speak from the African American angle, like very specifically in the show for you. Uh, yeah, I, I would I say I would say that uh, Adamola's piece. Uh, I agree. Yep. Very much on that subject, and again, he's he's dealing with that whole that that, that schism in America. It's manifesting itself politically today, but you know there is a racial component to it, and it's and it's an undercurrent of everything. So uh, from the African American point of view, that's always been the the issue with being excluded from something that you built and never being given credit for uh, being a um, part of America for you know, I mean it's 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 black history isn't just black history, it's American history, right? But it's it's shunted off to the side and it's you know compartmentalized and you know these types of issues, so I, I think that Adamola uh, has addressed that in his uh, wonderful image that you see in the exhibit there. Well, what about uh, well, Michael he, Kelly's work? I, I know it well, has. I, to I, yes, well, uh, again, he is he is very special because he he encapsulates these different issues. You know, the diasporic issue, the African American, and his use of materials is uh, is always very captivating. Well, there's a certain whimsy, and I, and I remember yeah. reading, maybe I'm off, that, that he, he was also in some way beholden or attracted to or invested in the Negritude movement. If, is, is that the case? Do you, do you see some of that? I mean... Um, yeah, it was definitely embedded in, in, in his work. In, in most of the things he does, if it's either painting uh, or sculpture, 
uh, it has that rawness, but it has that uh, that that respect to you know the black black history, and uh, you know historically, I mean, I've you know he's been around much longer than either of us, and his his history is there, uh, you know, to be to be read. But he is uh, he's done some marvelous works and contributions over the years to that movement. And it's still his work is very very relevant today. I mean, uh, the pieces we we chose, Alexis and I, I mean, they, he has some exciting work that we have to choose from. Yeah. Um, I I don't know you guys, but why why don't we also may, maybe we can just start talking about the artist's work itself because some of some of the work is is quite moving. I mean, all of it, but. For example, I, I wanted to start, you know, individual sort of conversations about, uh, about um, well, Diogenes, for one. You know, Diogenes, it's a funny thing. Diogenes has been the bridge from the Boriaiti, being Bori Haitian, as it were, Boricua, but he's got yes, a, that's a right. grandfather. Uh, then, you know, thanks to Diogenes, uh, you know, uh, we've met, uh, Anderson and I, and then we had a remarkable artist from Haiti join us, Patricia Brintle. And, and then I think on the strength of the Ohenes piece, that big mural with the column in front, the yeah. Clemente asked us, well, maybe we can leave that there as part of the, you know, of the MLK exhibit. So, so in a way that, that, that sort of precipitated this, this, this. In, yeah, we know, definitely have to build the entire exhibition around the piece. So we have to make sure that we select our works that actually uh, become very balanced because- Except, that, except then you brought Tanda Francis and there exactly. was a total balance to immediately. A mirror, mirror image, when we, saw, you know, when, we, when we saw that work, we knew that it, it needed to be in, in the exhibit. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it just, yep. you know, it, it would bring everything, you know. Well, it's a beautiful how it helps to counter counterbalance, and they're two immensely powerful pieces in their own right, and they they really command attention. So I really like that that sort of uh, you know tete a tete between those two. And then yeah. subsequently, we we try to mirror that exhibition in the gallery with the exhibition in La Tea. So we have to create that balance so the people when they see the show, of course, virtually. They don't see two different shows. They see one show. It kind of flows. Yeah, exactly. Flows. So we try to mirror the, the, the experience. You know, we have to like make sure that the, 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 whole, the entire show, the entire projects have a balance between one space and the other. So that's what we... But Latea, Latea is also more intimate. You know, it's a, it's a more intimate. You have the grand gesture with, with uh, the Ohenes, Tanda, and, and the folks. Yeah. Right. And then you, you go more intimate. Let's, let's talk about the Latea selection a little bit too. Moses, for example, uh, is Miro Ademola in the, uh, in the in Abrazo. He's bringing that pre-making looking piece. And they, they're using serigraphy as, the, as, a, as, a, as a way of expressing. Even though Ademola is using painting, but it have that pre-making feel. Yeah, and yes, yes. Try, yeah. And then we're trying to mirror that and also are working on the same thing. You know, it's like the the, the 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 race differential, the race inequality, and and all that, and all that kind of thing. Navy is also mirror uh, 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 the the experience that Tafa is bringing in, in into the in the gallery. Tafa is working with the uh, with the with the masses, with the protests and the inequality and all that stuff. And and, and Navy trying to trying to express that specifically with the different with the with the with the chess board that she manipulating and, and it was a nice ex expressive way in a conceptual way of, of presenting a subject like like Diego Anaya is also doing the thing uh, in in the in La Tea is also mirror something uh, some of the artworks that 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 Miss Amor present in the in the in the gallery. So we're trying to mirror all those two artists. And yeah, then Pablo the, the Caviedo. elements, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Pablo Caviedo is working ma is more in the elements, in the style that, that Michael Kelly, you know, is trying to express on his sculpture. It's a little, it's an image of Barack Obama with uh, uh, elements of, of, of 
uh, 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 symbols of Latin America, you know, like, like okay. Native American stuff like that inside the, the image, you know, and, uh, and I see it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful piece. And then we try to create this balance between the two, the, the two uh, exhibitions, and, and 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 we go from there. You know, the the, the extraction of Fran de las Mercedes in the in the idea of, of presenting, uh, uh, doing doing a, 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 a portrait in the extra way of, of George Floyd is, is is very 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 much interesting. And also, yeah, like I mentioned before, um, uh, Nelson Alvarez that is working with. Uh, Selma, you know, the, the bridge and the... And the yeah, what and it what hits about... All, what, it hits home on the theme, you know, of, yeah. of, it just hits right there in the heart of the theme. Yeah. Uh, the social reckoning. What about the social, uh, the, 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 the female perspective in terms of that social reckoning? Do you think, um, do you think that's uh, in, in enough evidence or that it comes out for, for, forcefully or is it also a, an, underlying, an underlying theme in some of the works? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, the, the, the film of Rafaela Luna, she's bringing ex excellent painting. It's a very nice painting expressing this, this social reckoning itself, you know, like, like from her point of view as a, as a, as a Afro Latina, from her point of view, she's presenting an artwork that actually very much is working on the, on the theme itself, you know, like, like the, the, you know, she's not using the image of, of the Reverend, but she's using the theme itself, the, the reckoning. Uh, to 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 express us from her point of view as, as an Afro Latina, an Afro Latina living in New York, and uh, and Jani also using uh, you know a uh, literal you know like she's writing something on her mirror, so you have to read what she presented and you have to interact with the with the with the piece. So when you see the piece, you see of your, yourself, and then you you have to read what what she wrote. It's a very conceptual piece that have a a very powerful. Uh, uh, image so it's very it's, it's very much interactive so you have to get in front of the piece and see yourself and read what you wrote which is very powerful as well well some some word uh Ander, um anderson how, how would you feel uh some some i heard a rumbling that that maybe the clemente would would also tap you know it's it started developing a new team of of, of gallery handlers curators whatever you know and and they might want to talk to the artists. Would would you guys feel, uh, you know, like like we could maybe try to organize something where the artists themselves um, can can you know can talk with you, Alexis, and with you, Anderson, about about yeah the work. I don't see why not? Yeah, I think that yeah, I'm sure that we can arrange to have that. I mean, it might not have them all together at the same time, but we can work right. towards having a representation of the artists. Uh, that sure. would be really interesting, and I wanted to segue uh, out of this for for a minute there, and uh, and really uh, ask Anderson a little bit more um, since since you have such a big note event coming up. I mean, you know the the, the Barbados um, art fair. Like how how talk to us. A little, I'm sure many people will be interested in this. You know uh, the the selection this year, how it's being affected by COVID. Yeah. How what what are you what are you planning you know well you know you it's uh, funny that you mentioned that because we are just uh finalizing our first uh piece of promotional material uh for the event um normally with the physical show we have we'll have a couple of uh, special exhibits within um uh, within the fair itself there's a a continuing a continuing exhibit called the diaspora dialogue and that where we, in, where we include artists from the Americas and, uh, and Africa. And we, we juxtapose that exhibit in, in the middle of uh, the fair itself. This year we are also having, that, that, that exhibit will be virtual, it will be presented as part, as the, part of the online uh, fair. This year we are having uh, an exhibit featuring seven emerging talents from Barbados. Uh, and uh, these are all artists who, you know, there's mo some of them are a couple years out of art school, uh, whatever. And uh, they're really making ways, using some innovative techniques. Uh, some of them are into <coughs> uh, using more uh, modern imagery 
and so on to, uh, to bring to their art. And uh, we will be able to present them virtually as well as physically on the ground in Barbados. <coughs> Excuse me, at the small gap. And we'll always have a couple of uh, conferences. We will have uh, the curator of that exhibit, uh, another up and coming uh, young uh, artist from Barbados. <coughs> Excuse me. She will be presenting, uh, she'll be doing a presentation and interactive with the artist. Uh, and, and we'll be able to establish that date pretty soon. But that's going to be part of the program and during the two weeks of the fair. And we'll have a couple of other uh, interactive uh, events. So all of that will be available on the online platform. Uh, well, this. if if Alexis doesn't fly me to Barbados, maybe <laughs> maybe we can get a link and and promote that uh, via La Tea or have a night where we can like do La Tea Remoto or and plug into that because it would be splendid to you know to continue this you know pursuing uh, some sure. of the topics like the diaspora you know sort of in, yeah, internal. Of fact, yeah, yeah, we'll have, we'd love to have you because I know that one of the uh, potential presenters uh, is an interdisciplinary artist who investigates these same issues that we're discussing. So it may be, it may be, it may be a possibility that we can have uh, a, a kind of a, a meeting of the minds, have one of you uh, in on that uh, panel or presentation during, during March. Uh, um, in, the Kappa, in the Kappa period. Very cool. Yeah, that would be very cool. And and Alexis, I mean, while we're here having this repartee and chatting all together, um, I I wanted to bring up the subject of of your writing. I know you've been, you know, lately you've been very invested in in your writing and yep. um, you know theoretically and uh, and otherwise. So and and I you know I really appreciated. Uh, how, how you work with with Anderson, but but I know you put a lot of work into the the statement. What what? How's your writing coming along these days? What are, what are you working on? Uh, it's going well. I mean, I'm writing. You know, I'm using writing as a, you know when I'm painting, I'm painting. When I'm writing, I'm writing. When I'm creating, I'm creating. So I'm using one activity as a, the rest of the other. But I'm working on a, on a book about Cuban art. You know, and everywhere in every part. Should be of fascinating. Artists. I'm, I'm, this is the second installment of of a book that I published in 2009, Reflection, and the uh, the sensationalization of the Cuban art. So this is the second installment. So I'm being putting essays together and I'm adding, you know, ideas into into little by little, and also working in some other in some other investigative books about about culture and you know. And Afro-Cuban culture and, and, and things like that because I'm very much interested in all these topics and trying. Well, to I saw I saw Anderson, you know, like reacting exactly how I was reacting when you were talking about this this the, the Cuban art. I mean, as, as Caribbean neighbors uh, and you know that I've always had some kind of solidarity uh, with Cuba and the oh, situation. Yeah, sure. yeah. Yeah, matter of fact, uh, la just in 2020. We had a feature, one of the featured exhibits in, in the fair was an exhibit of, with two Cuban artists who uh, had roots in Barbados. Their families had gone to Cuba to work on the sugar plantations many years ago. And they, uh, and, and they reflected that, that part of their ancestry, but they, they're uh, pretty well known artists in Cuba and we were able to get them, <clears throat> at least one of them to come to Barbados and uh, present uh, their artwork. So it was an exciting part of that. And we have, we try to build on those relationships within the Caribbean because we are all, uh, you know, Caribbean people. What I meant, what I meant to ask Alexis when we were talking is also like what, you know, when with Cuba, every even the lyrical becomes uh, political, right? Uh, you know, it's a, and that must be a challenge as as an as a Cuban artist. And I'm, you know, my my father is Cuban. I am, you know, I have some some Cuban heritage, which I'm extremely proud of. But I also know there's also that fatigue that every time we go into Cuba, 
it's, it's politics. And it's difficult, thorny politics. It's very passionate politics. I mean, it's, it's kind of spilled over into the United States political scene when you think about it. So, so how does that, you know, for, for Cuban artists, Alexis, how, how does that, how do you handle that high wattage all the time? I try to be true to myself. And I know that, and I'm trying to see it from my own experience as a Cuban artist living in exile, uh, because I'm a political refugee. So I was literally kicked out of Cuba. So I try to see it from my own point of view and be true to myself. I mean, I, I cannot lie to myself. I think not the situation in Cuba is very difficult. I know Cuban artists in Cuba, they, they're going through a hard time. They're not, not everybody is, 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 is exhibiting abroad. And I'm trying to, in some sense, with the triennial, we're trying to open that door, you know, create that kind of platform and create that, that idea. It's very much, it's very, very difficult. And I'm sure Anders so understand what I'm talking about. It's very much difficult to try to create that because in Cuba, the, everything you have to go through the government. And then yes, everything yeah. is very much political for them, <laughs> even though you bring it from the point of view of the artist or, or a curator. You, you, you are presenting an art project and whatever voice that artists have is very much important in the project that you're working on. That is my point of view. I'm not interested in any uh, ideal politics that do, that government has. I'm, I'm focusing on the artists. But sometimes the artists are working in conjunction with the, uh, with the government and then we have to stay out of that. You know, we're looking for pure artists that actually want to present the work. Yeah. And that's it. No, and I, I agree. I agree no with that. You know? Any I, politics because it's a pollution. Yeah, it's yeah. creating a pollution and it's going, and it's attack the project in the, in, in the sense. So yeah, I've had to deal with that. So I, I, I totally understand. And as an organizer, you know, in the Caribbean, I, I want to be inclusive. I, I want to, yeah. I want to be able to showcase our entire region, and it's sometimes difficult when you have to deal with those political issues. And then, not, not only that, inside Cuba, there is laws established to, to, to you know, against the art, against the artist. So you have to follow those laws, which are ridiculous, because you know, like three forty nine you know, 370, that are attacking the art itself. So artists have to deal with this type of stuff inside Cuba. So when you are trying to work on a project from outside Cuba, you have to deal with that stuff too. And then it's, 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 it's completely ridiculous. And then, and then you get frustrated, but the most important thing is the project itself, the projects that we're working on. It doesn't matter if it's an exhibition, a conference of a book. The project is the most important thing. So it wasn't I'm easy. To, I'm trying to be true to myself and trying yeah. to make sure that the project doesn't get polluted in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned the Bronx Triennial, which I, I know you- The New York, you New York Triennial. The, the New York Triennial, um, which I know you and Steffenberg, Luis yes, Steffenberg yes. have, have really worked- Luis Steffenberg is the partner in crime. Yes, assiduously for, for a long time. I mean, now, you know, so, so, and you mentioned that you, you're hoping that that can help platform, you know, some Cuban art, which I, I would welcome. I think all of New York would welcome. Um, but, you know, this, this, this past year, it, it was, it was remarkable what, what you guys accomplished, you know, like, like how it came about, the plurality of spaces. How, how do you see that? I mean, you have some time, which is the beautiful thing about a triennial, you know, because it, it takes time to develop these projects and it yearly goes by like, like nothing. But yeah. now you have some time. How do you see the triennial, you know, Steffenberg and you like working on the triennial to, to create, I mean, a fabulous platform for Latin America, which I, I truly believe there isn't one yet in New York. So... How, how we are the one. Um, uh, it's growing in the sense. We already, we, before the last triennial in 2019 and we already start working on the, on the, on the one that is coming up in 2022. And uh, we were discussing some ideas and we were discussing some presentations and then I start working on the essay for, the, for that. That's another thing that I'm working on right now is putting the triennial or, or we are working on because it's me and Louis. So, so we are discussing almost every week, you know, 
aspect of the of the next triennial and how we're going to present it. We already have 98 artists already looked up for the next one. So we, we are pretty much, you know, putting pieces together to make sure we have the shows that we present are very much uh, in conjunction with one another and everything is, uh, everything is cohesive. And, and, and we, bring in, we bring in very much, we bring in some high-end artists this next edition. And we are working very hard to put all these shows together. And uh, actually, I don't know if, uh, I, I, I think the, the, the next triennial is gonna be, it's gonna be very much, I mean, it's gonna be very current because what's happening right now in the world, I mean, and the thing that we're gonna bring to it, uh, is is unbelievable i mean well i wondered if we had waited two weeks to put on this show two more weeks what would i what would have been what would the show have looked like i mean if we if, if this had been opening like two weeks from now can you imagine be, it would be it would be as 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 current as the show that we have right now in latea and abrazo because uh the theme is 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 up to date and i yes. know a lot of things in the world are not going to change in the next yeah, the artists are year already and a half. Looking at so we are very much working issues, yeah. and uh, we are bringing a theme that is uh is, is, is it got some roots in latin america in the sense that is based on the birth of the continent itself you know from the from the native all the way to the to the migrations you know that happen either by force or by volunteer you know, by, you know, slavery or, 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 or the, even, even the Chinese, the, the, the Jews that travel to Latin America and, and, and establish it. So we are working on these roots that make our continent what it is and, and rich and, and, and beautiful and, and, and all those good things that, that are making this continent. So all these ideas and all these things are going to be so current because, they are, because the artists are going to work or are working right now and things that made that make this continent possible. So I know it's gonna be an unbelievable show. You know, and um, so far we're trying to bring 150, 125 artists, and we already have 98. You know, we're trying to confirm a few others, but we have a very good selection of artists, and the shows are gonna be very good. Yeah, sounds exciting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's one of the big projects that I'm focusing right now. And Luis is, I mean, we, we, we not even say hello to each other. We just go right to the point. And then we start talking about the triennial and the theme and then what are we gonna do? And this is it. And, and then I show him, you know, pieces of the essay and then we discuss it and we go back and forth, back and forth. And we make sure that when we put up there, they have the quality and they have the sensibility of, of what we're trying to present. Um, you know, from Barbados, what kind of a community, Barbadian, you know, here in, in New York? It's pretty large, actually. I mean, you know, you find <clears throat> in the tri-state area, New York tri-state area, uh, many large communities of the English-speaking Caribbean countries like Barbados and Trinidad. And it's like a little, uh, it's like a little Caribbean there in, uh, in certain parts, especially Brooklyn, Brooklyn, right? In some parts yeah. of Brooklyn. Yeah, I mean, they say there are populations of, of, of Barbados here actually larger than what's on the island, you know, kind of thing family, extended family, whatever. Uh -huh. So it's a very strong uh, community. And uh, it's very community-minded also. You know, a lot of the organizations like to be involved and give back to the country and get involved in these types of cultural uh, uh, activities. And the first Barbadians, kind of, I'm thinking of, of Puerto Rico and Puerto Ricans here and how, how we came from the end of the 1800s, sugar or tobacco rolling or that kind of thing. You know, we, we landed in New York. Well, what you know, about a lot of, I actually did an exhibit on this many years ago. There's a, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of Caribbean people were involved in the Panama Canal. And after the canal was built, many of them ended up coming to the United States. Uh, some went, obviously went back home. They were sending their money back home and they made for a better life there. But of course, many single men and young men and, and women, you know, that they were looking for uh, 
bigger prospects, more opportunity, and many of them ended up here. And the, you know, subsequently different waves of uh, immigration from from those islands. But yeah, the, the, the Panama Canal was a big catalyst for the English speaking Caribbean people uh, coming to New York. Many of them ended up in Harlem. And uh, before Brooklyn became as popular, Harlem was the stepping, was the stopping point, you know? Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, matter of fact, the Caribbean American Day Parade began in Harlem and then it migrated to Brooklyn when the community started to move there in large quantities. So that's just a little part of the, the history of the movement, you know? And that's New York for you, you know? Yeah. Movement yeah. and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, 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 and uh, yeah, it's a fascinating place, New York. I, you know, I, I, I love it, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a part of me also, you know, uh, coming from Barbados. I've lived in New York now uh, longer than I've lived in the Caribbean, and both, I call both places home, so, you know. So what do you guys think now, you know, just talking a little bit before we, we sign off uh, about COVID and go, I mean, you guys are all, you, you are entrepreneurs, promote, promoters of, of, of our art, of the art of, of Latin America, African America, Caribbean America. So, you know, there you, you definitely are stakeholders and are also a huge, uh, you know, uh, holding agency, for lack of a better word, for, for other folks that, that, that we promote, that we exhibit, that we discuss, write about, this and that. So how do you see... Um, how do you see the evolution of the pandemic? How do you see our, our thing, uh, our exhibitions, our, our endeavors sort of coming back to normal or just trans, you know, translating into a, into a different circuit altogether? Look at us via Zoom right now. That's what you call normal. <laughs> yeah, what, what do you think is going to happen? And again, just... I don't think it's going to be, I don't think we're going to come back to normal the way it used to be. Yeah. But I think we're going to, we're going to, we're going to come back to some normality. I mean, something that we, we be able to interact with our be able to, to have physical shows, uh, virtual shows, you know, like the people actually come. Yeah, you know, be in the same room again and the artists go up and hug people and stuff. Exactly. So it's been very hard for artists to, to, to make a living, you know, to, to interact with people because what we do is, is the interaction is very important, you know, the, yeah. Talk, people come and see. They, the art will have to be, you know, have to be felt. And uh, and uh, and this been, this been a year or oh, past year. It's been really, really, really difficult. So hopefully, uh, in the next few months, we can have some sort of normality. I saw it's going down in Puerto Rico a little bit, nothing to brag about. And then, you know, how is it in, in Barbados? Is it is it really out of control or it's okay? No, or? no, actually it's been it actually has been very good here. We just had a spike. Uh we just had a spike uh with a couple of clusters. Uh because obviously it's a it's it's built on tourism here. They were they had restricted a lot of the, the travel, but now they've opened up. It's the winter season. Hotels have to be run, you know, uh, and the economy, you know, has to flow. And even though there are many very strict protocols, there are people who have found ways to go around it. And, uh, it, you know, that's how you get problems. Very low here. There's been seven deaths overall, and maybe... Well, there's now maybe about 400 cases or so. So, but I mean, over this period of time, it's still a very safe environment. So, <clears throat> it's it's something that we have, all have to deal with. But getting to, you know, how difficult it has been. I mean, it's it's a dichotomy because on the other side, uh, this this period has shown how important the arts are to our life, to everyone's life. I mean, we've basically been at home, right? And you're, you're, you're watching a movie, you're tuning into some event online, more of these forums, virtual fairs, virtual shows. And that's what's, that's what's kept people going. That's sustenance. That's been yeah. real sustenance, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, the arts uh, can provide that, you know, in spades, but 
then again, the artist, the practicing artist, you need to make a living also. That's that's always the tough part: the support, the 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 the, the sales of the artwork, things like that. Um, <clears throat> we'll look at it over a year and and be able to tell how successful that has been for the practicing artist. Well, I would like to end. I think that was very hopeful. That that was a great way of of you know uh, ending. Alexis, if you'd like to to have a. a one last remark or anything you want to point out before before we you know we bid our farewells i just want to uh give thanks to the latea and el clemente and to aldenson as well for this unbelievable project i mean you know uh, i start writing the essay and then start writing about this subject and it was like it was excellent the the the, the way we presented and then you know and then you review it and then some review it and then we discuss it back and forth. And it's very interesting. And so I want to thank you both and El Clemente for, for giving us this opportunity to, to present this project, which is it's become very meaningful to me since we started in four or five years ago. And it's become something meaningful to me. And I know every January I have to, I have to do this. This is part of my life now. And I'm thankful. I'm, thankful. I'm, I'm honored that you reached out to me to be a part of it. And I look forward to working with you guys in the future also. Yeah. Thank well, you so I, much. I really hope we can combine with the Barbados, you know, art fair. I, I'm sure there's a lot to, to, to look into. And I will potential. make a point. I will make a point of getting back with you on that. That sounds like a very yeah possible uh, a move. Let's make it happen. Well, hopefully we'll have another conversation with the artist. And before we go, Alexis, you have a fascinating piece back there. I see some oars. A little house and a sail. <laughs> Who is that by? That's an artwork by uh, a very good friend and a, and a very good artist, one of the staples of Cuba. His name is Jesus Rivera. He's a very good artist, very good friend. And, you know, he used to live in the area of New York. Now he moved to Florida, but we, we are very close friends. And, yeah, that's one of the staples of my house. He, he, he's part of my life as well. You know, he's, uh, yeah. That's very wonderful. cool. Well, thanks to everyone that joined us tonight. Please uh, keep with us. We have MLK all this week. And, uh, and thank you again, uh, Anderson. Thank you again, Alexis. Good night. My pleasure. Thank you. Good night.